Hey guys, Tammy here. And in this video, I'm going to talk about five mistakes to avoid in custody mediation. Now, custody mediation can mean different things in different places. So I really want to start with a little bit of explanation about that. Um, in California, where I am, we have uh, an arm of the court called Family Court Services um, that essentially does what we refer to as custody mediation. It's essentially a mini custody eval. Okay. In other states and other places, they essentially call it a custody eval. And what happens here is um, and every county is different in California too, which is adds another layer of confusion. But some counties truly do mediation and sit down with the with the parties and try to help them figure out what a good parenting plan would be. Some of the counties are what we call recommending, where it kind of turns into this mini eval if you don't agree, and that expert decides what the parenting plan should be. If you're in a different state. You could be going to a private mediator that maybe one of your attorneys hired or the court sent you to or whatever to see if you can work out a custody agreement or you could be subject to a custody eval or something like that to where you are going to end up with a report from this expert, right? So this is a very involved process. When I have people that are going through custody evals and trial and all that kind of stuff, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching with those people. Like I spend hours, um, you know, I have two packages where I either do like a 13 hour package or a 26 hour package with people where when you're in like that level of, you know, crap up to your eyeball, so to speak, we've got a lot of legwork to do, right? There, there's a lot of things to prepare for in that. And so these mini evals, um, when I prepare people in California, that's usually a couple hours of time. It's not quite as intensive as like a full blown eval. Um, but so I, I say all that because custody mediation can kind of be a term that means different things in different places. But essentially what I'm talking about is when you're dealing with some sort of custody expert who's going to make a recommendation to the court in your case. That's really what I'm referring to in this video, okay? Before I give you the five mistakes to avoid, let me just remind you, if you like this content, hit like on the video, subscribe to the channel so that you get notified as new videos are released, and as always, please share on social media. When people go in and they're in this situation where they're being evaluated by this other person, you know, a lot of times they're at a stage where the breakup is fresh, right? And in a lot of cases we've seen either people have affairs or there's some sort of um, large financial breach that destroys trust or whatever the case may be. So understandably, a lot of times you they're coming into this situation with a lot of anger, a lot of hurt, a lot of frustration over the situation. And of course, our tendency is to attack the other parent when we're in that mode. But honestly, attacking the other parent is the very worst thing that you could do in front of a custody evaluator of any kind, okay? If you are, are in California and you're headed to family court services, custody mediation, CCRC, Custody Recommending Counseling, uh, a PPA, it's called in LA, Parenting Plan Assessment. There's level one and level two, um, you know, any of those kinds of things uh, in other states, like I said, a CCE, um, a CFE. I, I, I've seen all kinds of acronyms for it. But you do not want to go into that attacking the other parent. That is the number one mistake and number one way to totally sabotage yourself, okay? Because they are not going to use the child as a reward or punishment for either parent. They don't really care about that parent's behavior, so to speak, except to the point that it affects the safety of the child, typically. I, I said to somebody today, I would love to tell you that um, verbal and emotional abuse is looked at, but honestly, most of the time it's not. It it's got to be like, off the charts in severity before it gets any attention at all, which is sad 
but true. Okay. But it's just the reality of the situation. And I think it's a pill that's difficult for most people to swallow. The second thing you want to do is you want to present your concerns in a problem focused way, not a person focused way. Let's say mom has a, you're concerned about mom's alcohol use. Okay. Let's just use that as an example. Then I wouldn't say, well, you know, mom just, she drinks excessively. And, you know, during the marriage, she used to have, you know, two bottles of wine every night. And, you know, she's never present for parenting. And I don't think she should have parenting time. And, you know, who knows, she's going to be drunk every night, not taking care of the kid, not doing homework because I had to do all that during the marriage. And when I'm presenting in that way, I'm very focused on mom and what, what her issues are, right? And if I present it in a problem focused way, then I say something like, you know, I'm concerned because mom's really struggled with alcohol use. It got pretty extensive during the marriage to the point to where she was really unable to even help the child with homework. Um, I did that most nights. I did the bedtime routine. I bathed the child. I put him to bed. Um, you know, I'm the one that got him up and ready for school the next morning. You know, usually mom would drink enough to where she ended up passed out on the couch. And so, um, the child wouldn't be able to see her in the mornings and I would have to get him up and get him off to school and make sure he makes the bus and I pack his lunch. And I do. It. So you can see just the difference in my narrative of how I'm describing that. It's not that I'm not really saying what mom's doing. I'm just not saying it in a mom this, mom that, mom blah, 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 blah kind of way. I'm saying, look, it's like really unfortunate. Like, you know, mom's got this issue. And so the kid doesn't get to see her and the kid, she's not involved with the kid and the, the kid, the kid, the kid, right? And that's where your brain needs to go is this is the problem. The problem is the child is not getting the time with mom. They're going to piece together the fact that, okay, it's mom, mom's and mom might be an alcoholic based on everything this person's telling me. So that's where that's coming from, right? That, that they're, they're a logical thinking human adult. They'll be able to piece it together too. I, I would hope anyway, <laughs> with working in this and doing what we do, I would hope that they have the insight to be able to piece that kind of stuff together. The next mistake that you want to avoid is, is know what you want. Don't go in there not knowing what you want. Don't go in there with a long list of complaints and no idea of how to solve them. Okay, the court has certain tools that they use to try to solve problems. Like if we think one of the parents is an alcoholic, uh, the, the court's probably going to order an alcohol assessment or order the person to AA or order the person to therapy or whatever it is. They have certain tools that they can use to do that. But a lot of times what clients do is they just go in with this long list of complaints. They don't actually state how to solve it. You know, and I know that you don't necessarily know the tools that the court has, but you do know what would make you feel comfortable. If the other parent is an alcoholic, then what would you need to feel comfortable? Maybe you need, and, and again, I mean, you don't want to make this about you, but you have to think about this before you go in of like, okay, what would it take for you to be comfortable agreeing to them to having parenting time? If they had a supervised visitation or if their parent was present during the visits, or they had Soberlink, you know, some sort of breathalyzer in their car. What what would it take um, for you to have a level of comfort about the child's safety? Not that you get to control all of it. You don't. That's a different thing. But have some ideas of like how you know, the court always wants to, or a child expert always wants to figure out, okay, we have this problem. How do we rehab everybody and get this child back into a functional relationship with both parents? That's always going to be the goal. And, you know, if one of the parents keeps drinking over and over and over and never does that, well, okay, then they never get to that stage of relationship with their child. But the court's going to try to give them that opportunity as much as they possibly can. Sadly, Thomas had a case like that about 10 or 12 years ago where, um, dad just kept drinking and kept drinking and didn't show up and didn't show up and didn't show up. And eventually he lo essentially lost custody. And it was just very, very sad because he couldn't overcome the addiction enough to be able to, you know, parent his kids. So it was really tough, but the court continued to give him multiple opportunities, which was frustrating for mom. But, you know, Thomas said to mom, look, Hey, you got to, you know, court's going to give him every opportunity and it's his, it's, it's up to him to win or lose on that. You know, it's his choice. Know what you want. Okay. 
That's one of the mistakes that you want to avoid is going in not knowing what you want. The next mistake I think is more common for men than women, and that is don't be intense. Okay. And I think the one for the the flip side of that for women is don't be argumentative. (laughs) Okay. So if you're in front of a custody evaluator of some kind, don't be argumentative. Men, don't be intense. Dial that back. You know, I got, I talk to a lot of men that are like strong, manly men, right? And they just boom, they know what they want. They come at it. They da, 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 da. You know, they mean business. And that's great. I, I love that kind of person. I have no problem with that. I can hold my own with that kind of person. I love talking to that kind of person. It's great, right? So I love coaching that kind of person because I can just be like, boom, boom, boom is what you need to do. They're like, great, I'm on it. Here's my thing. You know, we're just clicking, right? We're just getting it done, right? <laughs> but that doesn't play well usually in front of a custody expert because that person tends to have kind of a more holistic, licensed clinical social worker type of view of the world. And, um, so a lot of times I find that men that are that really strong masculine type that have a little bit more of that intense edge actually won't do as well in these situations. So one of the things that I coach my dads on is don't, is try to dial back that intensity, right? Take a deep breath, talk slower, be calm, try to soften your voice, you know, all those kinds of things. And then with the women, it's usually, you know, don't be argumentative. Don't be jumping in at everything the other person says, arguing back and forth about it and all that. The last thing that you want to do is you want to defer to the mediator. Okay. And part of this is just recognizing that your meet the the mediator or the evaluator or whatever label they have, they're the expert in this situation, right? And we want to kind of defer to them. That doesn't mean go in and say, oh, I have this list of problems. How are you going to fix them? Like I said before, you want to know what you want, but you do want to value their opinion, value their expertise, value their recommendation, and kind of defer to them because you know, we've seen this movie many, many times. So a lot of times when a client will say, well, I think we should do this. Like if a client says to me, well, I would like to do a nesting arrangement. Okay. Let me tell you what a nesting arrangement is where, if you don't know, it's where the parents rotate in and out of the house and the children don't, the children stay in the home and the parents rotate in and out. I had one family that did this many years ago. There were four children. There was literally nowhere either parent could go that they could afford another home for the children. So they got a satellite apart studio apartment and the parents rotated out to the studio apartment on alternate weeks and the other one stayed in the home with the children and then they swapped back and forth okay that is very difficult to do if it works it will only work in a very short-term manner and it's not a permanent solution so when somebody says to me I want to do a nesting arrangement I'm like here's the problem what happens when you buy groceries two days before you leave and then you leave and then you come back and all your groceries are gone and nobody left you any money or bought any more groceries. Okay. It's, it's points of conflict for people when they're rotating in and out of a home like that. And so on certain things you want to defer to your expert because they've done this a lot and they know they have the, they have the advantage of experience. Okay. So they know certain things. So Your five mistakes to avoid are don't attack your co-parent, present your concerns in a problem-focused way, not a person-focused way, know what you want, don't be intense or argumentative, and defer to the mediator. And if you can do those five things, you will be off to a great start. If you're facing this, a custody eval, family court services, any of those types of things coming up, please, 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 please contact me for help with coaching. It's so hard to undo a bad outcome. It's so much easier to coach you on the front end to help you get a better outcome than it is to try to clean up the mess after the fact. Okay. So if you'd like to learn more about any of that, you can go to divorceuniversityonline.com forward slash VIP dash coaching. There is a link on that page where you can book a time to speak to a member of my staff and learn about how I might be able to help you out with some of these things you're facing. All right. See you guys next time.